Welcome to this tutorial on the Julia programming language for beginners. Today we will cover getting set up with Julia directly from your web browser without having to download anything, writing our first program, which is going to be a Hello World style program, some of the different data types that Julia recognizes, such as strings, characters, floats, and integers, how to store that very uh, data inside of a variable, how to write a programming function to have your program do something, writing conditional, that is, if-then statements, how to write comments inside your code that are just for a human reader, and as Julie is perhaps most favored by the mathematics community, we'll close with how to do some basic mathematical operations with Julia, and I'm talking addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, of course, as well as exponents and uh, floor division, uh, the modulo, and so that's uh, that, that kind of uh, mathematical, basic mathematical operation. Okay, if none of those words made sense, or only some of them made sense, don't worry, we'll explain everything piece by piece. Timestamps will be in the description if you'd like to jump around. Let's jump right in with getting started with Julia. You can certainly download the Julia language directly to your computer if you like, and we'll put a link in the description to Julia's website for more detail on how to do that if that's how you want to do it, and you can uh, definitely follow along with everything that I'm going to say by doing that. But instead, what I'm going to do for this tutorial is I'm just going to use Julia directly from my browser without downloading anything. And so to do that, I'm going to go to a website called cocalc.com. This is a website from SageMath that uh, gives a number of different coding languages that you can do right in your browser. Uh, and it's geared really towards mathematics. You can, uh, but you know, there's no, no particular need to only use mathematics with it. You can certainly make an account, save your work that way, but no need. We can just click Run CoCalc Now, uh, as you saw on the homepage there. And it's loading. And uh, when it loads, it's going to give a number of suggestions for what programming languages they have to offer that you can use. One of the suggestions that's going to come up is going to be Julia 1.4, and that's what we'll be using today, though there are others that it offers. It offers you know, Python 3, the Sage Math language, C++, etc. So it's still loading, so we'll give it a couple of seconds, and there it is. Okay, so select a kernel, and as promised, it gives you, you know, a ton of different ideas for the languages that it has, but we are going to be using Julia 1.4, so click that, and it sets you up in a, uh, what's called a Jupyter Notebook, which is a way of executing cells, uh, executing kind of blocks of code, cell by cell, so to speak. You can see in the corner here that we are using Julia 1.4. Uh, one nice thing to point out about CoCalc is that it comes with a lot of pre-written snippets of code. So use the search bar, uh, flip through, you know, the different things that it can do. And so uh, if, if you're lost or if you're not sure how to write something, that is uh, one thing that you might be able to lean on a little bit. So let's zoom in just a, just a touch and we are ready to start writing our first program in Julia. So what we're going to want to do is, uh, for this program, we're going to want to make our computer give us an output that says, Hello World, which is a typical first program that anytime you learn a new programming language, you might uh, learn uh, to do. So to get that kind of output, it's historically referred to as printing, because in the early days of computers, the computer would actually print something out on a sheet of paper, and that's how you would see its output. But of course, in modern times, it will just print on your screen, so to speak. And there's a couple of different ways to do this in Julia. I'll show you two. First, the one that you are most likely going to want to use is printing with a new line, okay? And that's called print L. N. And so the way to do that is you write print ln, and that's uh, the name of what's called a function, which we'll get, cover in more detail later on in this course. But to show that it's a function, we put in parentheses, and so it's print ln with parentheses, and then inside these parentheses, you can write inside double quote marks what it is we want to print. In this case, it's Hello World. So this, and this is our program. It's going to print out Hello World. So let's hit Shift Enter uh, to run this cell of code. 
and there it is, hello world, all right? So we printed hello world, and again, that was shift enter uh, on a Windows, or you can go to cell and just uh, run, run the cell from this menu as well and see all the keyboard shortcuts there. Okay, so uh, another way that you can do this same program, though there will be a key difference that I'll explain in a minute, is with just print hello world. So if you do print hello world with just one line of code like this, it's gonna give you the same uh, output, hello world, but there is a key difference between print and print ln. If you do print ln and then inside the uh, parentheses, you put what you wanna do and then uh, you make another second statement all right, so print ln, print ln, uh, hello world, okay, and then you hit shift enter. This is gonna actually print it on two separate lines. It's gonna print this one on the first line, hello, and then it's going to print this one on the next line, world, okay? And that's uh, very different from if you were to just do print. And we'll do this, uh, we should make a space here, but I'm not going to because uh, it'll have a dramatic effect. When we run it, you'll see what happens. It actually all runs together. So that's why before I said, let's make a space. Yeah, so hello world all on one line because the print LN makes it a new line. Uh, the print will just keep it all smushed together on one line, all right? So that's kind of the difference between the print LN and the print, and going forward for the rest of this tutorial, I'm really just going to be using print LN, and you'll probably find that that's what uh, you'll want to use too for this kind of purpose. And uh, one last note, you know, this is a Jupyter notebook, so you, you actually don't need to write print at all. It'll evaluate the last line of your code, whatever it happens to be, and it'll give you an output, but that's really specific to Jupyter Notebooks, um, so so it's not going to be a universal thing across Julia, and so because I, I want to make this a little more accessible, I am going to use println uh, when I want to, you know, type something and, and have it print to the screen. Uh, okay. So now that we've printed something out, we should discuss what type of data it was that we printed. And we'll uh, use that as kind of a jumping point to talk about the different types of data that exist in the Julia programming language. What we printed was text inside of quotation marks. And that's what's called a string, all right? In Julia, there are a bunch of different types of data, which to a human eye might not seem so different, but to a computer will be quite different. And the first that we'll look at are called strings. And as you can see, a string is, can be thought of as a means of processing text for a human reader. Uh, the string might have numbers in it that the human reader will understand, like this string, is, which is, you know, quote, text, one, two, three, symbols, all inside double quotes is all a string, okay? Uh, it has a 123 in it, but the computer's gonna know that's not the number 123. That's just a string of 123, okay? And so there are two ways to make a string with Julia. One is to put your entire string inside double quotes like we did before with Hello World or like you can see in this first example. And the other one is to put your data inside these kind of triple double quotes, okay? So a set of three double quotes uh, encased and so on, on either side of your string, okay? And we, it can be any text we want. It can be symbols and numbers. We'll take a look at a couple of things and play with this. So first we have uh, this string, hello world, but it could just as easily have been, you know, um, my favorite numbers are five and seven, and my favorite symbols are at and ampersand, okay? And so as you see, I put in some numbers, I put in some symbols, it's all inside these double quotes, it's all a string, okay? And we can check that by doing type of. And so what we can do is we can do type of println and let's go ahead and copy this and paste it in. And uh, this type of function is going to 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is backwards. It should be print ln type of, because we want to take the type of uh, whatever's inside the parentheses, and then we want to print it to the screen. So <laughs> let's do that now. Okay, and uh, as you can see, it is a string. Okay, and so that's that's fine, but it's not the only way to write a string. You could also, as we just saw in the picture, use three quotes. And so if you put all of this inside three quotes, it's also going to print it just fine. Why would you want to do this? Well, here's where using the three quotation marks will help you. If you wanted to put quotation marks inside your string, then when your string is encased in the three quotation marks, that doesn't become a problem at all. Uh, so you can actually now write my favorite numbers are five and seven, and my favorite symbols are at and ampersand. Okay, and you see it's trying to be helpful by popping up with extra quotation marks because it usually uh, you do you do want to write things inside double quotes. Uh, I, I think you can change that in your settings though if you're going to be doing a lot of things like this. So my favorite numbers are five and seven and my favorite symbols are at and ampersand. Now we are printing the string and we have quotes inside what we printed. So we ran it and it looked great. Another different type of data is a character, and a character is only one character encased in a single quote, okay? So as you can see in the picture here, it can be a letter, it can be a number, it can be a symbol, it just has to be one character encased in single quotation marks like this. Let's, let's print these um, each of these examples, I, the numeral eight, and an ampersand, and see what it looks like. So, print ln um, inside one quotation mark now, I, eight, and ampersand. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what it is, uh, so long as it's a character, and there it is, looks great. You can't mix up these two concepts. Characters and strings are considered to be different. If we do a couple of different words inside these single quotation marks, like this, okay, inside the single quotation marks, uh, it won't work. It's going to give us an error, invalid character literal. In other words, it's saying, hey, I expected to see a character because you used these single quotation marks. I expect to see something like A, uh, you know, but I didn't. I saw a, a bunch of stuff, and that's not acceptable. Uh, as mentioned, you can check the type of whatever it is you're working with with the function type of, and you can actually print that type to your uh, output. So if you do print ln type of, okay, and then inside this, you inside these parentheses, you can write the different things. Let's try a few. Let's try a, and then I'm just going to copy paste this. Uh, let's try A, and then let's try A with just single quotes, and then we can try ah, uh, and then um, I'm actually, just because it's going to throw me an error, I, which I can already tell you, I'm going to put in single quotes ah uh, on its own block. Uh, and so now let's run all the cells. All right, and so... As you can see, string, character, string, nothing happened here. Let's do it more manually. And uh, as you can see, invalid character. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that when you have a single character, if it's inside these double quotes, it's still going to, technically speaking, be a string, even though it's just one character. If you have just one character inside these single quotes, it's going to be a character. If you have uh, double quotes with a bunch of stuff, it's going to be a string. If you have single quotes with a bunch of stuff, not going to work, okay? It's going to be an, uh, a syntax error because it's an invalid syntax. And I'm going to clear these outputs by going to cell clear output just to, uh, just to make this cleaner. Okay.
Now, the next ty data types that we'll work with are two different ways of expressing numbers, integers and floating point numbers. Now, um, an integer, as you can see, is uh, essentially you can think of it almost like it is in math, like a whole number that's positive or negative with no decimal, no point zero, okay? No point whatever, uh, no fractional part, so to speak. Um, a floating point number does have a fractional part, it does have a decimal and some numbers afterwards, or even just a decimal will, will still be a floating point number. To a human being, these might seem like the same type of data, uh, but to a computer, these are very, very different. Uh, even though, you know, you might even have 8 and 8.0, they're, they're different. So, again, we can check the type of data by using this type of with the parentheses. So I do want to show you, just in our Jupyter Notebook, what we're going to do is print ln type of, and um, let's do a few different things. So again, I'm just going to copy paste this so we can have a few examples. So print ln type of four. Uh, let's do four inside single quotes. Let's do zero, zero point zero, uh, negative eight, negative eight point, you know, some numbers. And then uh, as mentioned before, let's do seven point with, you know, nothing. Okay. And let's run it. All right, so what does this tell us? Well, for the four, type of four is int 64. That reflects that it is an integer and I am in a 64-bit system. If we were using a 32-bit architecture, this would say int 32 instead. The next one was a trick. Uh, it's just a character. It's inside these single quotation marks. Doesn't matter that it's a number. It's still just going to be a character, okay? And the same would be true with double quotes if it were a string. All right. Then zero with uh, just zero is again an integer. See, int 64, it's an integer, but 0, 0.0 is a float. These are the same equivalent value. They're both zero, but uh, just, just because I have the point zero here, that makes it a float. And then these principles carry over, of course, into negative numbers. Uh, the negative eight is an integer, as you see. And the negative 8 and change here, negative 8.23, etc., is a float. And then this last one, 7 point, uh, is also a float. You do not need to have a 0 or anything. Um, that'll work just fine. Okay. Can uh, you print these data, different data types if you just did print ln? You certainly can. If you do print ln of, you know, 8 or something, it's, it's going to print the 8 if you do print ln of, you know, 0, 0.0 or what have you, it'll print 0, 0.0, no problem. So the print ln is not just for strings and characters, it also can work just fine with integers and floats. Okay, for our next topic, we will learn how to store data and use it later using what's called a variable. A uh, variable is a very powerful tool. So for example, if we wanted to have the words, this is my awesome string, okay, it would be very tedious to write this out over and over again. You might make a mistake or even to copy paste it over and over again. And so you, and, and also, you know, you might want to start by writing, this is my awesome string, but change it later, uh, any number of things. So in order to have that kind of functionality, what you can do is you can store your data, in this case a string, but it can certainly be a number, a character, a float, an integer, any kind of data inside a variable. And you can do that in a very simple way. First, by typing the name of your variable and then an equal sign, and then that will store it inside the variable. And when you run it, okay, you see it has an output because I'm in a Jupyter notebook, but really all that it's doing is it's storing it inside the variable. So if you print ln variable, um, you see it will uh, print just your variable. Okay. Uh, the variable, it, it has to be kind of a continuous string of characters. I believe it cannot start with a number, but you, usually by convention you will separate with underscores if you're going to make it multiple words. Your variable can be called anything. It does not have to be called variable. Let's uh, call this one, you know, awesome data uh, because we'll be doing in a couple of different kinds 
of data, all right? And you should probably, frankly, uh, make it something like this that is a little descriptive of what is going inside it, just to make it helpful to the reader of your code or even to yourself if you're rereading your code. And so we've we've called our variable, we've called it awesome data. This line, this equal sign, it's not a mathematical equal sign, it's a syntax saying, I'm gonna store something inside this variable called awesome data, all right? And uh, what's being stored is my awesome string. And so then if I print awesome data, if I print that variable, you know, it's printing, this is my awesome string, okay? And uh, that's where it gets really powerful. You don't you don't have to print, this is my awesome string. You can just print the variable. It's stored the data inside your variable and saved it for later. Uh, okay, so if you wanted to store something different, if you wanted to store the character A, you know, it'll uh, now, now awesome data has stored inside it the character A or, you know, 88 or, you know, whatever, 88.8888888, you know, it's, uh, it can do it. It'll store it. All right, great. Um, it's very powerful. Now, next, we're going to discuss a few different ways to use these variables to manipulate strings. And we just learned how to make variables, and one, can, one use case for variables is you can put them inside strings and uh, kind of save for later what might go inside that string. And the way you do that is with a number sign. So I'm going to show you an example. Uh, let's let's go ahead and clear clear all this output. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear all output and make it make it totally fresh. So when Harry Potter learned about wizarding money, he learned that there are 29 nuts in one sickle. If he had 232 nuts and wanted to use Julia to calculate out its worth in sickles, how could he do so? Let's make a couple of variables and then we're going to use a uh, uh, money sign to, uh, you know, because it's a money problem. No, I'm kidding, because that's actually what you would use to manipulate a string. So let's have one variable called num canuts. Um, and <laughs> one, there, there is a debate over whether it's with a silent K or not, but I'm certainly going to use a hard K if it's going to be called num canuts. Okay, num canuts 232. And uh, then num sickles, let's have this be num canuts divided by 29. All right, so you can probably already see where this is going. We're going to make a little formula here because we know that there's 29 nuts in one sickle. So if you take your number of nuts, uh, of canuts, <laughs> uh, and then divide it by 29, then uh, you are going to end up with your number of sickles. Okay. So let, now, now what we're going to do is we're going to put in a uh, print ln statement, print ln, and double quotes, don't forget, because we're going to put in a string and we're going to say you have dollar sign, name of our variable, which is num canuts, Harry, that's worth dollar sign num sickles that is all right what's the anatomy of this well this dollar sign is a signifier that we're about to write in our variable okay and this variable it the program has num canuts as 232 so it's actually instead of dollar sign num canuts it's going to write 232 and then it's going to say that's worth dollar sign num sickles okay which we saw is just this figure divided by 29 and let's see if it worked by running the code shift enter and there it is you have 232 harry uh let's make it canuts and sickles let's do that one more time all right <laughs> uh, just to make it a little more readable you have 232 canuts harry that's worth 8.0 sickles that is all right so Notice a couple of things. Instead of printing the dollar sign variable, it printed out what those variables were. It knew that we wanted the value of the variable there. Notice that when it did the operation, even though it's only using integers, 232 and 29, uh, it's 
actual, and even though those numbers divide evenly and could have made an integer 8, it's still giving us a float value in our answer, and that's important uh, because the, when these two integers are divided, it actually gives us a float value in our answer. What's another way we can do this same thing, but this time with only one variable? Well, we can use the dollar sign to do some math right inside our string. We don't need the second variable. If we want our computer to no longer, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to comment it out. I'm just going to delete it because I don't think we're coming back to this. So numcanuts equals 232. Well, uh, what you can do is you can... Um, right inside these parentheses, inside these quotation marks, you have num canuts, canuts Harry, that's worth, and then instead of num sickle, uh, num sickles, which no longer exists, I almost said sickles there, oh my goodness, okay, so that's worth, um, so now let's do inside parentheses, num canuts divided by 29, why did I say inside parentheses? Uh, so that this dollar sign will modify this entire uh, figure here, and that's going to do a little bit of math right inside our statement, all right? So it's the same thing. That's worth 8.0 sickles, that is. If he, you know, Harry, of course, inherited quite a lot of canuts from his uh, family, so, you know, it, it, he could he could certainly have any, any value here, but let's keep it 232 because it's so clean. All right, so you... Um, can play around with this here. You can put in strings, characters, other other things with this dollar sign. It'll it'll work. So let's do a different a different program here. If you did um, your variable equals hello, which is just a string, and then you do print ln um, dollar sign bear because that's the name of your variable and that's storing hello. Okay comma, world, hello world, there it is, okay, dollar sign variable, hello world, okay, um, you can manipulate strings in a couple of other ways as well, there's a function called string, this can uh, do what's called concatenating strings, which just means putting two or more strings together separated by commas, so the function, uh, remember anything with these parentheses after it's considered to be a function string, uh, hello, comma, world, comma, exclamation mark. Okay, so this is going to add these together. And, um, you know, one <laughs> tip is to not forget a space. Okay, so hello, world, uh, you know, like I just did. Okay, hello, world looks great. And you can throw a number in here. It will be working just fine. Um, it'll convert it to a string. So, hello, world space this time uh n uh, number three okay and so what is this so we have hello world number three so it's greeting world number three hello world number three notice this three was not in quotation marks but it still was made into a string and added to our string, no problem at all. You can generalize this principle by using the string function to turn something that wasn't a string into a string. So if you have some number, you can do string of that number. It'll work with an in, uh, integer or a variable. If you do string of, oh, I, we just saw it with an integer, we did string three, so I'll show it to you with uh, float. Uh, you see, now it's uh, made into a string. Technically speaking, I should have printed this, but because it's a Jupyter notebook, it works just fine. But just to show you in a more uh, perhaps correct way, all right, print ln string, and you see it printed it. It became a string. It's fine. Um, if we wanted to do the type of this string, so now we're not printing the string, we're printing the type of this figure, which remember was just this, you know, float value, but now it's a string. Okay, great. Two last ways to do this. One is if you have um, some variables, as, as just mentioned earlier, you can do this just with variables. So if you have hello equals, you know, hello there, and uh, let's do world equals beautiful, 
world. Um, if you print ln of, uh, and I'll show you two ways to do this. One is hello star world, um, and that'll actually add these strings together. Hello there beautiful world works fine. Or you could also uh, just do what we did before with these number signs inside a string number, uh, not number sign, I'm sorry, dollar signs inside a string, dollar, hello, dollar, world, there's no need for space because we have a space up here, hello there, beautiful world, works great. All right, now let's talk about functions in a little more detail. When we did print ln with parentheses, excuse me, that was an example of what's called a function, essentially Something that we want our computer to do to uh, carry out is, in this case, to, to print something out so we can see it. But we can actually make our own functions in Julia quite readily, and there's a couple of ways to do it. I'll start with a way that's most similar to Python, because that's, uh, long-time viewers know, that's, that's my fave. Um, but we uh, will do that by writing the word function. Okay, followed, uh, and then follow that with the name of what we want to give our function, followed by parentheses. Let's just keep it simple with hello world, followed by parentheses. Okay, so function, hello world, parentheses, which is similar to how you do it with Python with like def, but you know, a little different. So function, hello world, parentheses, and then uh, you just hit enter and it'll go to the next line for you and it'll indent. If it doesn't indent for you, make sure you do it yourself. You need to indent here, okay? And in the uh, next line, we write what we want our function to do. Let's keep it simple and just have it print ln, hello world, all right. And then this is important and different from Python. We need to show that we're ending our function by typing the word end at the end here, okay? And that shows that we're ending our function. That's very important, so don't forget to do that or it'll give you an error. And then when we wanna use our function later, uh, say, you know, in another block of code, for example, or we could, eh, actually, let's just do it on the same code. I don't wanna make it too complicated. So in any event, when we wanna use our function later, we can just write out the name of our function followed by parentheses, and we can run it. And there it is, it did it. Okay, hello world. And I'll actually show you uh, this in a different cell as well, just to show you both. And so if we run all, okay, you see it describes what happened because I'm in a Jupyter notebook. This, this wouldn't happen if it was a different environment. And then it actually prints the uh, function, hello world. Okay, looks great. What happens if we don't have that end? Let's try it if we do not have the end. We'll see what happens, run all, syntax incomplete, function requires end. It's actually a very helpful error because it tells you exactly what the problem is, unlike some, some errors that don't. But uh, there it is, hello world, looks great. When we want to use our, uh, Oh, and one, one, one more point, you know, I just did one line here, but you can make this several lines. You can do a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm just keeping it simple, but you can make this as complicated as you want. So it's really very, very handy. Uh, so we can, uh, let's, let's do, actually, let's do a function that's a little more interesting. You can put, uh, and, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put an argument inside the function to use later and let's make a completely new and different function and let's uh, take our same example that we did before when to have uh, a function called knuts to sickles all right and inside these parentheses let's write the name of a variable num knuts and no we, we don't have this variable defined anywhere yet uh, but that's okay then in this next line, what we can do is we can do print ln, you have, and let's do the same kind of thing we did before, knuts, knuts, that's uh, num knuts over 29, sickles, that is, all right, so, what did we do here? We made a function 
The function is called canuts to sickles. Inside the parentheses, we wrote num canuts. And then in our next line, indented, we wrote what we wanted that function to do. What we wanted that function to do is print ln, you have, and then whatever the variable num canuts ends up having the value as, canuts. That's, and then whatever that variable is over 29, sickles, okay? And then don't forget to end your function. And you do that by typing in end in the last line, just like so. Then later, when we're uh, using our function, we can feed it an argument inside the parentheses. So remember when I said before that you have uh, this parentheses to have your, it, to call your function, to, to run your function, so to speak. Now you can give this a value and I'm just going to keep it 232 like we had before. So if it's canuts to sickles 232, now the computer knows, ah, num canuts, that was 232. Okay, so what I'm going to do at the computer, uh, the computer's going to do is I'm going to print out you have 232 canuts. That's and calculate 232 divided by 29 sickles, that is. All right. And then I'm going to end my function. Okay, so let's do it. Shift enter to run. And it did it. You have 232 canuts. That's 8.0 sickles. That is. All right. One more way to write this. Instead of writing this all out in multiple lines with the word function and all that, we can also assign the function, much like we assign a variable, all in one line. And so first we put in uh, the name that we want to give our function. So if we do hello world, then equal sign, just like we did with a variable. And don't forget the parentheses. That's what makes it a function, not a variable. <laughs> Very important. Hello world, parentheses, equals, and then what we want that function to do. In this case, print ln, hello world. And then later, if we want to use that function, we just type it out with the parentheses, and it'll do it. No sweat. So the function hello world does what we assigned it to do. Again, you can put an argument inside these parentheses. So if we do canuts uh, to sickles num canuts equals print ln, you have dollar sign num canuts canuts, that's dollar sign name of the variable uh, over 29, but let's put it all inside parentheses so it doesn't get angry with us. Sickles, that is, all right, and then let's run it. Okay, and of course, uh, nothing happened because all I did was create the function. And so it gives us this output. It just tells us what it is, a generic function with one method. If we wanted to do the function, you can do it in the same block, or I'm just going to do it in a new block. Canuts to sickles. And this time, let's uh, put a value inside the parentheses. Let's keep it 232. And let's run all. There it is. You have 232 canuts. That's 8.0 sickles, that is. You can change this. You can make it whatever you want. Okay. So, and uh, of course, notice it's uh, going to give you a float. All right. So those are two ways to make functions. There are other ways uh, that will work. So do take a look at the documentation for more details, but I don't want to belabor the point. Those are two ways that make functions that will both work for you very well. So next we are going to discuss conditional statements. Oftentimes when writing a program, you want the computer to make a decision for you based on the data that you're giving it. And we can do this in Julia using conditional statements, also known as if-then statements, okay? So I'm going to clear my outputs here. So you can do, uh, so, so I'll just show you this as an example. Say we had a variable and it equaled five, 
the way the con there's a couple of ways conditional statements work. I'm going to show you the way that's most similar to Python first, because uh, this it, that that's that's my favorite, and then I'll show you a couple of ways that are uh, different. So, if we have a variable and we equal five, the way one way that the conditional statement works is we write the word if, and then whatever we want to check to inform its decision. So let's do variable equals equals five. These two equals is a way of showing like is equal to. So this single equals is assigning a variable. The equals equals sign is more like saying it's equal. Is this equal to? Is it a true statement that this side and this side of it are equal, basically? All right. Then uh, so that's what it's going to check. And then if we want something to happen on the next line, you want to indent uh, this. You know what, what I'm using is very nice that it indents it for me but make sure you're indenting. You write what you want to happen if this statement is true, if our variable is equal to five, if that's a true statement. So let's just print ln uh, that variable equals five, okay? And then we need to end our statement. Uh, so, and don't worry, we'll show you other ways to branch out this decision tree further, but just to keep it simple, we end our statement with the word end, and that is similar to what we saw before with the function. You need to end your statement. So let's run it. That variable equals 5, because of course it does. Sorry, right, we did set the variable to equal 5, so it shouldn't be a problem. And also, one note, even if it's a uh, an integer here, uh, an integer... Uh, if it's checking for an integer, but you give it a float, if they're equivalent values, it actually will still work. The variable does equal five. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, if we didn't write end here, and we tried running this, yeah, nothing happens. Okay, so it uh, incomplete, premature end of input. It's confused. It wants to see that end. Okay. Now, what if we wanted a couple of different options? Some or more branches on your decision tree, so to speak. You can do a couple other things here. If you have something specific in mind that could be another choice, you can do what's called an else if statement, okay? And that's the word else if, all one word, uh, else if. So, and then you can write another option that it could be. So if variable equals equals, Eight. And then on the next line, indented, write what you want to happen. That variable equals eight. Okay, now if we run this, it's still going to say, uh, it's just going to choose this choice because our variable equals 5.0, variable equals five. But what if it equaled eight? This time it chooses this choice because the variable equaled eight. All right. Well, what if you didn't have something else specific in mind? You just wanted to do more of a catch-all. If the variable equals anything else, well, you can write in a new line, not indented, the word else, okay? And notice we're not going to put else variable equals equals, you know, nine or something, because if we had that in mind, we would have used else if, okay? Instead, we just write else and nothing else, and then go to the next line, make sure it's indented, okay, just like before. And, um, you know, you could just print ln that variable equals something else entirely. All right. Now, if we run this when the variable equals 8, um, it's going to still say the variable equals 8. But now, if the variable equals, you know, 90, Okay, the variable equals something else entirely, some other thing, it's a catch-all for everything else. You don't have to have the equals equals here, you can also do things like greater than or less than, for example. So, uh, if, you know, you have your variable equal 30, and then this time, say, if the variable is less than 5, and um, let's change our string to so that it makes sense. And then if you want to do, say, greater than or equal to, you can actually do a greater than sign and an equal sign, one after the other, greater than or equal to. 
is greater than or equal to eight, um, and then the else would be that variable equals something else entirely. All right. Well, what's going to happen when our variable is 30? Uh, as you might guess, it's going to say variable is greater than or equal to eight. Shift enter to run it. That variable is greater than or equal to eight. Perfect. And what if it was less than five? If it was like negative 98 or something? Well, it's certainly less than five. Okay. And then what if it's neither less than five nor greater than or equal to eight? What if it's, you know, six? That variable equals something else entirely. It doesn't fit into any of the above categories, so it fits in our catch-all, the else choice. So that's the way you do it that is most similar to Python, and so the way that, you know, uh, someone like me who uh, might be coming a little bit more from a Python background will prefer, but that's not the only way to do it. Another way to do it is with what's so... the um, is with the so-called ternary operator, and the way that's written out is kind of this A question mark B uh, colon C, and these spaces are important. It actually needs these spaces between these things. So what, what does this mean? It's asking, if A is true, then do B. If A is false, then do C. So here's an example. Widgets equals 70. All right, so now let's do widgets greater than or equal to uh, 60, question mark, println, that's a lot of widgets, space, colon, space, println, not many widgets. Okay, what is this doing? When we run it, uh, it's going to print, that's a lot of widgets. Why? Well, the widgets is a variable that is uh, storing the number, the value 70. And in our first chunk of this line, before this question mark, we write out what amounts uh, to our if statement, asking if widgets is greater than or equal to 60. Then, after our question mark, we're going to write what we would do if this first part is true. If this if statement is true, uh, we're going to print that's a lot of widgets. Then in our final chunk here, after this, excuse me, after this colon, we have what's going to happen if that first part was not true, in which case it would print not many widgets. And so when we ran it, of course it did that's a lot of widgets because this is true. Widgets are greater than or equal to 60. They're 70. So it's going to print this first statement. If we had this as 59.9, not many widgets, okay? And so that's a ternary operator. One last way to do a conditional uh, statement is with what's called short circuit evaluation. And to do that, we can use kind of this <coughs> Excuse me. This A ampersand ampersand B. And it will return true if only if A and B are also true. And so in this example, uh, we had widgets set to 59.9, right? So widgets equals 59.9. So let's have widgets is less than or equal to 60 ampersand ampersand one plus two equals three. All right, um, no, I'm sorry, double equal sign. One plus two equals equals three, one plus two is equal to three. So uh, what will happen when we run this? Well, first we need to show that uh, it has to be true that widgets is less than or equal to 60, and also one plus two has to be equal to three, which of course we know B is true, and in fact, A is also true because widgets 59.9, we are less than or equal to 60. So when we run it, it's true, okay? Uh, but if we had our widgets being, you know, 70, now it's false. Even though one plus two is equal to three, it's false because this one isn't true. And we can use this to our advantage because the way Julia works, one consequence of this is that Julia 
is only going to evaluate the first chunk of our line here before the ampersand ampersand if it's false and then move on. It's not going to bother checking 1 plus 2 is equal to 3 because it doesn't have to. It already knows this whole statement is false, so it's not even going to look at this, much less evaluate it. As a result, you can treat this short circuit evaluation as a conditional statement and put a function right here in our uh, after our ampersand ampersand print ln, you know, hi there or something. All right. And if we run it now, it's just going to say false because it's not true. Uh, widgets is less than or equal to 60 is false. So it's not going to bother moving on to this. But if it was true, if our widget so now, instead of um, ampersand ampersand, and I just copy pasted this, you know, I'm sure you can find it somewhere, but I just, I just copy pasted it. So now it's only going to print if uh, both sides are false. So this is the opposite. Ampersand ampersand said it's going to, you know, return if, you know, both sides are true. Now it's only going to work if both sides are false. So you see, instead, it's going to say true, but if both sides are false if this is 90 now it's going to print high there okay great so that's three ways to do conditional statements with julia either with if then statements the tertiary operator or the short circuit evaluation next i want to discuss comments in our code sometimes you might want to be able to put some kind of explanation in your code just for a human reader maybe someone else who's reading your code, or even for yourself, if you want to go back and read your code and see what something meant. So to do this, uh, there's a couple of ways, but one way is to preface your line with this pound sign like so. The computer will just skip over it, okay? It's not going to read this at all. A human can read it, but the computer will just ignore it. So if you have, um, for example, you know, say you have your function println hello world, one thing you can do is right above this, write as a comment, so the pound sign will print hello world. Okay, and that's kind of the explanation of what's going to happen when we run it. It just reads this part, it ignores that part, okay? Uh, another way to do it, though, is if you wanted a longer comment, you can actually write like a pound equals sign, and then a bunch of stuff, you know, some here are my cool comments, um, yippee, okay, and then whenever you're done, you write equal sign, pound, and then that'll, now you see it's written in a normal uh, thing again, print ln, hello world, and it did it. Okay, so that's a good way if you want to write a bunch of stuff you can do. Pound equal sign, just remember to end it with your equal sign pound. Works no problem. Finally, another application of this same principle is that if you want your computer to skip over a line of code, but you don't want to delete it, you can write a comment before that uh, line and your computer will know to skip it, Some somewhat calling it like commenting it out. So print ln, hi there, cool people. All right, so say you only wanted to print hi there, cool people, but you didn't want to delete hello world. Um, you could just write that pound sign and it will um, know now and see even the color change. It now knows to ignore this and it will only print hi there, cool people. Okay. Finally, our last topic today will be the different arithmetic and mathematical operations you can do with Julia. Julia is incredibly powerful for math, and I do hope to make more math-focused videos with Julia in the future, but uh, just, just to show you as an introduction, we're going to do uh, the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, and then some others. So addition, um, and you know, normally you can do print ln and then what, whatever it is, but because I'm in a Jupyter Notebook, I'm actually going to take advantage of being in a Jupyter Notebook and just put these all in different cells. Okay, so let's do 3 plus 4, 3 minus 4, 3 times 4, 3 divided by 4, and 3 to the power of 4. 
So these are the different mathematical operators that might be what we expect. Three uh, additions is a plus, subtraction is a minus, multiplication is this asterisk, this star, division is this uh, slash, and then uh, to anyone on the street, this might not be surprising, three carat four, three to the power of four, uh, though if you're coming from a Python background, that is different. Uh, three star star four would be how you do it in Python. That's not the case here. You do it, you can do it three carat four. All right. And so now let's just, you know, run uh, all the cells. So cell run all. And you see it did all of these different things for us, no problem. Now a couple that are a little less intuitive, all right? Let's uh, do a couple that are a little less intuitive. Okay, so let's do integer division. If I wanted to get just the integer and not the remainder, so if you know long division, for example, 28 divided by 9, right, is going to be like 3 remainder 1 because uh, it'll divide... 28 will divide 9 evenly three times and then in, to get 27, and then there will be a remainder of 1 at the end. So if we just wanted the quotient and not the remainder, so to speak, what you can actually do is 28, and then, this is this is crazy, the divided sign, like you were writing it by hand in elementary school, 28, the divided sign, 9, okay, and that gets you just the 3, okay, so just the quotient, just the integer, okay? Um, and so no remainder of one. The different side of the coin is what if you only wanted the remainder? And to do that, you can use what's called the uh, modulo, the modulus operator, and that's a percent sign, 28 percent, oops, uh, 28 percent nine, shift enter to run the cell, and now it's one. And so that's 28 percent nine to get you, um, 28 modulo nine, you could say, to get just the remainder. And then what if you wanted, hey, I want both the uh, quotient and the remainder. Uh, well, you can certainly do that. There's a function for you that's built in called div rem, div rem, and then 28 comma 9 for 28 divided by 9. If you run that, it'll get you 3, 1, that is to say 3 comma uh, 1, 3 remainder 1. Okay, so those are some of the Mathematical operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, raising to a power, uh, this integer division, getting the remainder, getting the uh, quotient and the remainder. And with that, that's it for this tutorial on the Julia programming language. If you got value out of this tutorial, it would mean the world to me if you gave it a like. And if there's a future topic in Julia that you'd like me to cover, please do let me know in the comments and I'll try to oblige. Thanks very much for watching.